start. Okay, well, good evening and welcome to Making Michigan, the Bentley Library series on the history of the University of Michigan. I'm Gary Krenz. I'm going to take this off this part, sorry about that. I'm pleased to be a lot of you. Long three years, right? I'm pleased to welcome both our online audience participating on YouTube and our in-person audience here at the historic Julian Stanley Franklin Detroit Observatory. Uh, I also welcome our panel members, Shirley Koppelman, Anthony Rappaport, and Roger Rappaport. I'll introduce them in more detail in just a moment. Before that, I want to say that as the archives of the University of Michigan, the Bentley Library acknowledges that the historical origins and present locations of the university were made possible by cession of lands by Anishinaabe and Wyandotte peoples under coercive treaties common in the colonization and expansion of the United States. We note in particular the grant of land made by the Anishinaabe under the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids, which was signed actually on this date in 1817 for the college at Detroit so that their children could be educated. These lands continue to be the homeland of indigenous people, and we seek to reaffirm and respect their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and to recognize their contributions to the university. So tonight, we're going to look at the period from 1955 to 1970 in the US, in the world, and at U of M. We find some interesting comparisons and contrasts with our own era. The U.S. in 1955 is a nation economically and geopolitically ascendant, but also locked in a Cold War right, with the Soviet Union, with the possibility of a hot nuclear war always present. It is a period in which the United States mobilizes public will and tremendous resources to accomplish large things in the name of public welfare and solving large problems. For instance, the development of a vast research infrastructure, mostly based in universities and exemplified by agencies such as the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. A dramatic expansion of higher education, including research as I just mentioned, but also in terms of access at places ranging from flagship universities like U of M to the brand new community colleges that were springing up all across the country. A new commitment to public health and in particular mental health, which will be important in our discussion tonight. A movement in governance leading to the expansion of the safety net first embodied in Social Security and culminating in the 1960s with Medicare and Medicaid. And if we continue to trace this arc through the 1970s, right, we see the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the Vietnam War, the anti-war movement, and of course three major assassinations in the United States. During this same period, some of the developments in Michigan that exemplify this larger arc are the formation of the Mental Health Research Institute, now the Michigan Neuroscience Institute, dedicated to a systems approach to addressing mental health. The growth of systems theory and game theory is a hallmark, or one of the hallmarks, at any rate, of Michigan social science, and eventually and ultimately the first teachings concerning war and the environment. I just mentioned systems twice intentionally because there is also an academic movement that emerges in the early part of this period seeking a new approach to addressing complex dynamic problems, general systems theory. The idea that a holistic, interdisciplinary, mathematically sophisticated approach to complex systems examining their systemic nature and internal relations was key to understanding and finding solutions. And that will be part of tonight's story as well. Now, 1955 to 1970 also happens to be the tenure of Anatole Rappaport at the University of Michigan. You might well have heard of Rappaport in connection with game theory, and in particular with the program Tip for Tap, which was the winning strategy in a famous prisoner's dilemma competition held uh, here at U of M. But of course, there is much, much more to this story. As you may also know, if you read the recent article in Michigan Today, written by one of our panelists, Roger Rappaport, that story led directly to tonight's event, and I want to acknowledge Deborah Holdship, Michigan Today's editor for publishing. We are going to explore, as our title says, the journeys, both intellectual and personal, 
of this remarkable individual and his singular impact on and contributions to some of the things that I just noted. He links them together in a way that tells the story of that era. Uh, and before and after, I might add. We are fortunate to have an outstanding panel for this purpose, some people whom it has been a real pleasure uh, for me to get to know as we have worked toward today's uh, event. First is Shirley Hoppelman, Clinical Professor of Management and Organization in the Ross Business School and Clinical Professor in the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. Uh, she is a leading researcher, expert, and educator in the field of, of uh, negotiations. She holds a PhD in Management and Organization organizations and an MS in organization, an organizational behavior from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University, my alma mater actually. Koppelman is author of Negotiating Genuinely, published by Stanford University Press. She is past president of the International Association for Conflict Management and former faculty director of research and business practice at the Center for Positive Organizations. Uh, she has received outstanding teaching and prestigious research awards. Next is Anthony Rappaport. Principal violist of Sinfonia Toronto, viol violist of the Windermere String Quartet, and a founding member of the Aradia Ensemble. He is son of Anatole and knowledgeable about his life and his working aspirations uh, in a way that only familial connections can I, expect, can I suspect bring. With Sinfonia Toronto, he has appeared as a soloist, Corey Broadley, and recorded four CDs. With the Windermere String Quartet, he has performed over 100 classical works on period of instruments, including the complete Beethoven quartets, and appeared as artist in residence at festivals in Ontario and Quebec. With Aradia, he toured New Zealand and recorded 14 CDs. He has been acclaimed as a violist of distinction by Berliner Pakistanzum, and a splendid violist by the New Zealand Herald. Anthony received a Doctor of Musical Arts degree from Juilliard School in New York. Finally, uh, not least, of course, we have Roger Rappaport, who is an independent film, uh, author and filmmaker. Uh, Roger is the LSA class of 68, a cousin of Anatole. Uh, he covered the teach-in movement for the Michigan Daily, and as editor published a series of articles about war research at U of M. His books include Citizen Moore, Hillsdale, and Grounded with Captain Shem Malmquist. His articles appear in the Los Angeles Times, Stack News, Wired, the San Francisco Chronicle, and Michigan Today. He is the producer of three award-winning films, Waterwalk, Pilot Error, and Coming Up for Air, which you might have seen uh, the um, uh, trailer for on the screens, uh, that is going to be shown tomorrow uh, as part of Cinetopia at the Michigan Theater. His play, Old Heart, premiered this year in Detroit. His novel, My Search for Sarah Price, will be out later this year. Roger lives in Muskegon, Michigan. And here I want to give a little shout out to those Muskegonites and ex Muskegonites like me, uh, who I know are online <laughs> tonight. So, hi uh, guys. Uh, anyway, I apologize for our HVAC system. We're in a new building, we're still tweaking it. That's partly why we're uh, amplifying. Uh, but in any case, without further ado, uh, let's proceed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It is a real honor and pleasure to be here um, tonight and to talk about the legendary work of Anatole Rockport. I had um, a scheduled presentation about his work not so long ago. Um, interestingly, it was on the day that we shut down the university. So for me, it's symbolic to actually give this talk today <laughs> because that very morning, um, I was scheduled to speak as part of a teach-in. Um, that commemorated the earlier teachings that we'll talk about tonight, um, celebrating Earth Day at 50 here at the University of Michigan. So, how did I get to know the work of Anatole Rappaport? Like many people, I studied it um, when I learned about economics and, and worked towards my PhD, and it's a name that everyone is familiar with in so many fields. Um, a small act of um, cooperation in an environment that I was in um, was an invite to write an article about on Paul Rappaport, and I, I had no clue what journey this would open up for me. Um, I never could have imagined the amount of time and research um, that went into this, both personally and academically, and it's just been a really incredible opportunity. I 
was invited to write about his tit for tat contributions, but it clearly very fast went beyond. Um, and so I'll be quoting some pieces from an article. I'm very excited to share that this article is available without a paywall, so anyone in the world can access it um, at the moment, which is not always true to the work we do as academics. Um, and so you're invited to read it. Um, it includes contributions and testimonials from people. It opened up relationships that I didn't imagine at the University of Michigan, around the world, uh, and I finally got to meet Tony. Um, thanks to this event, we have talked so many times and shaped the work um, that came together in pulling this article together. Um, so Rappaport was a leading figure in systems sciences, um, studies in conflict and cooperation and peace research. And it's interesting because his formal academic training was in mathematics, his writing was also eloquent and innovative when it came to meta-theoretical ideas and philosophy. And he spanned scientific disciplines through pioneering work, um, in a way applying mathematical models to biology and the social science, but so much more, so much more. Um, if we think about his work, and as we were chatting earlier today and discussing it, he made foundational contributions um, to really diverse fields. There aren't a lot of people um, in academia who are able to make contributions in parallel to fields that are so distinct and so broad. Um, including semantics early on in his career, to mathematical psychology, to decision science, game theory, general systems um, theory, and peace research. At the University of Michigan, um, when he arrived here, his focus of research really was um, shifting to war and peace, conflict and conflict resolution. And he made many contrib contributions as he devoted himself to what he called the three arms of the peace movement, peace research, peace education, and peace um, activism. Um, he made really, really seminal contributions to game theory that I want to just take a moment to talk about. Um, but I think, as you can see here, research, education, and activism, I also think that it's incredibly unique to have someone who is such an intellectual contribute through um, thinking and theory, research, empirical work, but also in education, and also through activism. And it's something that we try to do um, and is, is really straddling a lot. So while he was here um, during these years, some of his work um, is presented in the books that you can see here, Prisoner's Dilemma um, with Albert Shaman. I know his family is on with us online right now, so thank you for joining us. Um, Fights and Games and Debates, um, and, and many other books and many, many articles. And he's really known for what we're seeing behind um, this Prisoner Dilemma game and the tit for tat strategy. Um, to this kind of situation in which we can study, maybe some people think about it as the petri dish of the social sciences. And it's a big foundation in economics and in social psychology and decision making. Um, what we're looking to see through these games is what predicts cooperation versus what we call defection. Okay? And in a broader way, you can think about it as the psychology of eliciting cooper cooperation in interactions between at least two people. Okay? or small groups, or society, um, at any level of analysis. I um, had the fortune to work on this from my very early years in my um, PhD program, and since then, looking at psychological factors of influence cooperation, and there's so much research that has happened um, since those days in the 60s, and you can just see through this model that's up here, different types of variables that people have studied, and this is from a review article, in my own empirical work, what I um, looked at was the influence of culture in different areas of psychological um, variables that influence cooperation. And I think um, there's so many people who continue to do this work that really is, um, you know, was founded by, by a few people and many of them here at Michigan. And it's, it's really fascinating to think about that. What is interesting beyond the empirical work that so many of us do trying to understand cooperative dynamics and how to foster cooperation is to think about the underlying assumptions and logic. And that's where I was fascinated reading the works of Anatole Rappaport, including his very early books on semantics. And I think his approach to philosophy came through in everything that he did um, in his career as an academic. And so I want to share a little bit of how I've been thinking, because this is where I wish I could speak to him, um, about something that we call a logic of appropriateness, and my research has been to try to understand how a logic of appropriateness 
is actually culturally embedded, and so we need to think about a culturally informed logic of appropriateness, and that is in distinction from something we would think of as a logic of rationality. So even though we study game theory and we study these paradigms, and they're very helpful, they're really helpful in theory, and they don't always predict human behavior. And so what we've learned as social scientists and psychologists coming in and joining economists um, in modeling um, these ideas is that maybe instead of asking what's rational, if we would like to understand what it is that people cooperate, we would be better off thinking theoretically, what do people think is appropriate? And an appropriateness question is, what does a person like me do in a situation like this, given our culture? Um, it brings in identity, who am I in the moment? It brings in recognition of the context, the rules or norms of how you might do things in that context. Um, and the work I've done is to say, yes, all that is true, but in different diverse environments, and we have so much about diversity and inclusion as conversations on campus um, these days um, explicitly, I think this emphasis on culture really brings the group into play because people make these decisions in group contexts that are different um, by culture. And if we think about this, it helps us understand or it illuminates cooperation in what I call um, conversations with resources in the mix. Because I'm a negotiation scholar um, with empirical research in areas that relate to game theory. Um, and where I've taken my work from the applied and education side goes to ask, um, how can you be genuine when you do this? How can you bring um, yourself as a resource into these kinds of conversations and not confine yourself as a role actor as some of these assumptions in our field lead us to think about? And so I'd like to really focus um, on how that connects in this thinking about logics and meta level to the work that um, Anatole Rappaport did here um, at the University of Michigan. And I think many of us, when we learn about the prisoner's dilemma and game theory, don't quite get the sophistication and the depth of thinking um, that he intended to bring with um, the conversation that we have about this. And if you read his work, you can see that there is a clear critique of what he would call conventional strategic thinking. And he would invite us to examine the assumptions and reasoning underlying human dynamics. And this book in particular, Strategy and Conscious, was really important at this period of time because the questions that came made these um, mathematical equations not just be in the world of mathematical equations, as important as they, as they were with this advance in science to try to use math to understand society and behavior. Um, you know, there was this notion in, in his work um, that the people are not role players, but they're real people. Okay? Um, and um, if we want to understand how this works, we need to really bring conscious, conscience and ethics into the world of game theory and strategy. And if we don't do that, we're not going to reach the level of ability and potential to foster what we're trying to achieve as a society. Um, you know, I think um, it's kind of fun to think about people and imagine them. And then you have an opportunity to talk to someone in their family and actually ask questions. And to me, um, when, I, when I read the work, I felt like there's so much optimism in this period. There's such a belief in the 50s, maybe following World War II, that we can fix the world through science and education. And so one of the questions I asked Tony um, when we started talking was, was your father an optimist? <laughs> and he said he would never go so far as describe himself as an optimist. Um, and he maybe um, would like to remember his joke right now as saying despair may be rational, but there's no percentage in it. Um, and, and this is quoting from um, a byline that we published earlier this year with um, a colleague um, of Anatole Rumford, Marcus Schwanninger, um, who um, is in Switzerland at the moment. Um, but you know, taking what he um, thought about, and this is pulling a little bit from one of his latest last book's Conversations with Three Russians, um, you know, this work continues to matter, and we hope that bringing these ideas to conversations in society will help us do better and achieve um, better outcomes. I'd like to end my piece here by bringing us back to the teach-ins. I started with the teach-ins that we had a few year, years ago for Earth Day at 50, um, but Rappaport really played an instrumental role as one of the organizers for these events. And I think um, 
instead of talking about it, I'm going to invite us to listen to his words because we're so fortunate through Bethley to have discovered resources and that was part of my adventure. Meeting people all around the world, sitting in auditoriums in Vienna where Anatole Rappaport played as a young man. Um, you know, this journey was just a real, real life event for myself and my family. Um, but I'm going to play a little bit, uh, a minute of Anatole Rappaport speaking in March of 1970 in a panel on the war and the environment. There is still another reason why the environment has become a dominant theme of common discussion in the last couple of years, especially in the United States. It helps keep people's attention riveted on our government's sense of omission instead of its sense of commission. Sense of omission are more redeemable than sense of commission. Negligence is less a crime than murder. The damage resulting from a sin of omission is more frequently reparable than that resulting from a sin of commission. Moreover, it is easier to acknowledge a sin of omission than a sin of commission. A compulsion to justify one's inaction is usually not as strong as a compulsion to justify one's actions. So this was a pillow and you know the invitation to reflect on sins of omission and sins of omission to think about what we do and what we don't do as being as important and, and how deep that is when you're standing and talking in front of an audience um, at, at that time and today, right? Um, another short clip is um, just a few minutes later. I mean, resources are available online. Um, comes more directly about the war in Vietnam. The war in Vietnam and more generally the United States war policy of the past quarter century is a relevant topic in a teaching on environment because environment as it pertains specifically to human being includes more than physical and biological environment. There is also a semantic environment, an ocean of words in which we are submerged from infancy to death. The human nervous system is continually subjected to a barrage of words. They come to us from other people, from boxes installed in our living room, and from sheets of paper that many of us hold before our eyes for several hours a day. This barrage is as part, as much a part of our environment as the air we breathe. It's really kind of you know, touching to, to hear him speak with us today. It's as if he's here, right? Um, and thinking about the words that we hear and how the words form actions, those of omission and commission, and how important that is from the perspective of what we do um, together. And so um, I want to shift from the semantic environment to the musical environment as a note of transition um, to Tony, um, because the musical environment was incredibly valued um, in the Rappaport family. And my transition is an image that we found um, in the historical archives uh, here of a concert in which Anatole uh, Rappaport played in a recital. We did some work with a few people at Bethley who tried to figure out, we found um, an advertisement about a concert, but we don't know if it matches this picture. And we did as much as we could as good um, detectives to figure it out. But I am wondering if someone was here at the time and knows where it was. Um, the picture and, and the footnote for the image are, are in um, the article I wrote. Um, the best we could do is think that maybe this was a pilot program piano recital on April 12, 1970. And if it was, then it was in the red carpet lounge of Alice Lloyd Hall. However, if you were there and you knew where we had grand pianos, which we know what you have found, but if you happen to be there, you might know and let us know more than that. On um, um, that note, Tony, um, we have some fun pictures of you from then and now. Thank you, Shirley, and thank you, Gary, and thanks to everyone who's here and online. Um, it's nice to be here with you. Um, my father's first career was as a musician. He uh, studied piano from late childhood right through his uh, his early 20s, he studied in Vienna, 
and uh, launched his career with, uh, with an explosive start, uh, playing concerts in Vienna and then starting to tour Europe. He had to leave Europe because of the rise of Nazism in, uh, in, the, right, in the mid 30s. Came back to, the, to America, concertized here and in Mexico for a few years, and then went back to school and decided to become a mathematician. Um, he kept on playing all his life. I played with him uh, frequently. The, the picture on the left is uh, me and my older brother Sasha uh, in our house in Ann Arbor in you know, about uh, 67 or so, and you know, uh, five or so. Um, the other concerts in Toronto, we gave concerts together frequently um, at the University of Toronto. That's, uh, that's where that was taken. Um, so that was a very, very dear part of my uh, upbringing and growing up, and, and it's my career now. Um, it's hard for me to uh, say exactly uh, why music was foundational to my father's uh, life and thought. Um, I said from the fact that he loved it so much. But I think it has something to do with the fact that as a musician who's entirely dedicated to music, you have to bring together the emotional, the intellectual, and the physical um, in, in one process. Um, and devote yourself entirely to it. And critically, you do that with very little recourse to words. Um, anyone who's ever tried to put uh, the, the meaning of music into words realizes just how hopeless it is. It can't be done. And so, unlike the environment he was describing of being barraged with words from the cradle to the grave, a musician and people who love music and spend time with music actually have a respite from that and are able to engage with themselves, with each other, and with life. Um, in a non-verbal way. And I think that's one of the key reasons why in his intellectual work, which is of course you know, entirely based on words, um, he was able to sometimes transcend limitations of, of dimensional thinking, and, or maybe even more than sometimes. Perhaps that was, uh, that was his main contribution. Um, so I, I believe music was foundational for it. Um, so I want to try to describe the process um, which led him to the University of Michigan. And I, in doing that, I, I have to say my own limitations. I'm not a uh, academic. I'm quite familiar with my father's work. I've read everything not mathematical that he wrote. I can't quite uh, do the math. Um, but other than that, I, and I had conversations with him from early childhood right to his death in my 40s. Um, and so I feel uh, like I can describe pretty adequately, and maybe to a non-specialist listener, maybe uh, more than adequately, what it was important what he was doing. Um, but the story starts with a uh, biologist named Ludwig von Bertolanti, who in the uh, 40s um, developed a theory called general systems theory, or the beginnings of a theory, uh, what he projected may one day be a theory. And the reason why he was working on this was as a biologist, he was very concerned with possible foundations of biology and physics. Um, all of the sciences, so certainly all of the natural sciences, are are intended to be connected together in a unified uh, theory. However, biology presents certain uh, key problems. Um, now, one, one of these problems is the problem of uh, why a, a living, living being seems to evolve to greater complexity over the course of its development from conception to, to maturity. Um, and, and species often evolve in the direction of greater complexity as they evolve. And yet, the whole universe is evolving in the opposite direction towards uh, less organization towards the eventual empathy, uh, uh, entropy, meaning uh, the, the uh, end of all activity. Um, so why are living systems able to do this? Use the word systems because living beings, uh, he conceived them as systems which are unlike a closed system, which doesn't exchange matter or energy with its environment and therefore has to become less complex and eventually run down with entropy. An open system, by exchanging matter and energy with its environment, can in fact go the opposite direction. Um, overall universe heads towards entropy is our inevitable end in the, in, the, in the distant future, but living beings can go the other way, sort of grabbing organization from their environment, from the universe, and concentrating it for a while during our short lifespan. And that was interesting to him, wanting to, to, to develop build into that. Um, another really key aspect of living beings is our homeostasis. What that means is we can be perturbed by something, uh, meaning we can be uh, uh, injured, or, um, or we can be moved, or, or uh, struck. A bird's thing, things in the environment can impinge on us, and within limits, we'll bounce back to where we were before. Um, and this is super interesting, because other, uh, other, for the most part, other objects, other things in nature don't do that. 
when something's done to them, it stays done. They don't, uh, they don't maintain themselves in that kind of way, the way living uh, beings do. So we wanted to talk about that too. So we developed a theory, or beginnings of a theory, called the uh, general systems theory, which was an attempt to account for these phenomena in a way that wouldn't just describe biology itself, but would actually be applicable to possible other, other areas. Um, so that led him to the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Science, which was founded in 1954 in California, and it was a, uh, a community of scholars who would get together uh, fellowships for a year and cross-fertilize ideas and work on their own projects and not teach for a while. And they uh, jokingly called it the Kasbah because it was such a, such a uh, luxurious setting for an academic to be able to, to simply think and work and talk to colleagues. Um, now, uh, this is the original charge to, to the, the uh, Kasbah. Um, through scientific work to increase knowledge of factors which influence or determine human conduct, and extend such knowledge for the maximum benefit of individuals in society. So Bertolanchi and my father and, and a number of other scholars had this as their intention. They wanted to study work behavioral sciences, bring their various uh, disciplines to bear, work together if possible, and, uh, and hopefully come up with some new directions. Um, there were four in particular who worked together closely over that year. My father, Bertolanchi, um, the economist Kenneth Boulding, who was already a faculty member here at Michigan, and the physiolo physiologist uh, uh, Ralph Girard. Um, and they together founded the Society for General Systems Research. Uh, sorry, I the uh, Society for General Systems Research is still in existence, but it's been renamed the International Society for Systems Sciences. Uh, now, while they were there, they were approached by James Miller, um, who was a uh, 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 who's, is, his specialty in psychiatry, as well as some um, other deal. Sorry. And uh, he had the idea of founding a mental health research institute, which would study mental health not just for individual humans, but on the whole, generalizing to the whole gamut of, uh, of, of um, living beings. Um, so the analogies of mental health on the level of the cell could be various kinds of uh, disease or dysfunction on the level of the organism, on the level of the, of the human mental state, and perhaps it could be generalized to the level of a, of a human group, uh, a family, a, uh, a society, perhaps humanity itself. Um, so this was the idea of the Mental Health Research Institute, which was founded in 1955 here at the University of Michigan. <laughs> so there's a... Uh, James Miller, Ralph Gerard, and Phil Rappaport. Um, they were the th first three faculty members of the Mental Health Research Institute. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Kenneth Bolton was already on faculty here at the University of Michigan. Now, here's uh, from the Mental Health Research Institute is now called the Michigan Neuroscience Institute, as, uh, as Gary mentioned. Um, here's something from their current website about their founding, which I think can give you an idea of how ambitious they were. Interdisciplinary collaboration is common today but at, at that time, it was unprecedented. The Institute would bring together psychologists, psychiatrists, biochemists, anatomists, physiologists, pharmacologists, geneticists, social scientists, law faculty, and clinical investigators to conduct basic and applied research within the broadly defined problem of mental illness, but also educating students and advising the state legislature. So, a, a lot on their plate, and a lot of the very divergent uh, uh, places they were coming from. Um, it's often pointed out that this institute was founded with, but funded directly by the state legislature in Michigan, and they often say it was uh, actually had a specific line item in the state budget. So it was it was very important to them. Now, there's a quote from my father about uh, uh, looking back on it later, how he uh, his perspective on that ambition and what it meant. I had misgivings about the scheme and about my role in it in particular. I agree that the concept of mental health could be generalized to pertain not only to the individuals, but to groups, populations, societies, and the like. I believe that group neurosis, mass psychosis, and perhaps other still to be identified forms of collective mental pathology were useful concepts with which to build a generalized theory of mental health. But I had misgivings about the way these ideas meshed with what the legislatures in the state of Michigan had in mind when they approved the financing of the proposed institute. I was sure they expected a flow of results within a few years results that would lead to a higher general level of mental health in the state, reduce the costs of hospitalization of the mentally ill, 
and so justify the expenditures. I expected no such results, but these misgivings did not suffice to prevent me from accepting the offer. So he came and uh, did some of his uh, first significant work on game theory while I was here. Um, by the way, thank you, Shirley, for, for pointing out about game theory and its what, what my father called the use and misuse of game theory. He always insisted game theory can't be used, certainly not to predict human behavior, but not even to establish uh, uh, recommendations about human behavior. He considered game theory to be very useful in creating very simple understandings of the idea of rationality, so that by seeing the very structures which underlie our decisions, we can hopefully make better decisions with full cognizance of the, of the, of the range of situation we're trying to, to operate in and our, our whole selves as people. So, the, the misuse of game theory, as it's often misunderstood and misapplied, um, is, is very clear. Uh, it's, it's especially true in the case of, uh, of economics, where the reduction of uh, human decisions to economic behavior, with the assumption of, uh, of selfish behavior, is so rarely describes actual behavior, and it's such a poor model for what behavior should be. And that's just one example, um, where, it's, where it's very uh, obvious to us, where, where it impinges a lot on, on our lives. Now, I wanted to ask a question, and I wonder if you might uh, consider it. Um, what are some of the reasons that scholars may have been concerned about the state of American society in the 1950s? Why did they want to extend the concept of mental health to the societal level? Why would they have been thinking along those lines? Anything about the 1950s that comes to mind? Anyway, um, I think we have a way of, uh, of taking things through the chat online. If, uh, so if anything comes up, let me know. Fear of nuclear war. The fear of nuclear war, yes. Um, the, uh, the nuclear weapons, which were first deployed in 1945, the hydrogen bomb, which was a tremendous increase in the destructiveness of potential nuclear weapons, the nuclear arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union, the spread of nuclear weapons to other countries at that time, um, uh, France and the uh, UK and, and China. Um, and uh, so all these things uh, went together to create a tremendous um, uh, sense of, of fear and also a concern that perhaps society was on the wrong track, that by uh, working towards its own destruction, society was perhaps acting dysfunctionally. The way my father would like to put it is that if you look at the at humanity from above as a system, as if it was one organism or even one person, and watch this behavior, you would see it um, in the same way you might see an ind individual who is uh, uh, assembling a gun, loading it, and, uh, and pointing at himself. You would, you would look at that behavior and you'd say, this individual is, is, uh, is on track to self-destruction. And if you look at humanity and the behavior of assembling ever larger and more powerful means of destruction and exacerbating conflict which might lead to their use, you would perhaps consider that humanity might be on that same track as that human individual who is loading a gun and, and pointing at himself. So this is uh, one good example. But what about others? Well, the 1950s was the time of the uh, of McCarthyism, of the uh, tremendous um, uh, effort within American society to identify and purge um, uh, people who were considered to be communist or, or leftist. And this was a, a process which had tremendous destructive effects. My father um, experienced it directly. He had been a communist in the 1930s. Um, he had many colleagues, of course, who were leftists or, or, or had been communists. And some of them were fired from the University of Chicago while he was there. Some of his fellows, fellow um, members of the Committee on Mathematical Biology at the University of Chicago were fired. He was not himself, but he resigned uh, from there and went off to California to the to the, uh, to the Casbah um, as a next step after leaving Chicago. Um, and uh, this, this continued on through the 50s. Um, so that's another, another factor. Another thing, perhaps a little harder to put your finger on, but I think it may have also been on their minds, was the tremendous um, social conformity, which was a big part of the culture in, uh, in 1950s America. In the post-war time, um, for instance, the, the, the tremendous change in the expectations of women, uh, middle-class women, um, that they would no longer be working as they had been throughout the war, and they would go back to, to uh, 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 an earlier role as, um, as homemakers and, and childbirth. Um, that's just one example of the kind of uh, informity and, uh, and nostalgic uh, conservatism that perhaps was, might have been seen as being getting in the way of, of progress or getting in the way of human uh, achievement, and perhaps might have been seen as dysfunctional in that way too. So there are various things in the 1950s. 
So what about today? Are there things about today's society that we might also be concerned about in terms of, of society, American society, or, or global society, however you want to think about it, in terms of our social function or dysfunction? Anything come to mind? Well, I think, once again, we have, uh, or perhaps it's just been continuous ever since then, I think, that these, we have uh, uh, confrontations that may lead to catastrophic war. We have a climate crisis, which is apparently impervious to, uh, to solutions, even though it's so widely recognized. And so that, that seems to be a, a possible dysfunction. Um, in, in the United States, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Canadian, so we, as many Canadians, I probably know more about the United States than most Americans know about Canada, and we're not immune to it in Canada. In the United States, there shouldn't, shouldn't see political developments that, uh, through the pandemic and before, which are, which are very concerning about whether we can actually function in society and make collective decisions and look after the well-being of, of each other and our, and our uh, communities. There, there, there are questions to be raised about this. So the, the idea of social, mental health on the social level is still very current. And it's worth asking what we're, how we're studying it, what kind of solutions we're working towards. And I think these are the kinds of questions that my father would be concerned with if he was uh, still alive today. Well, with that, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Roger. Um, my cousin Roger is, uh, as well, Gary's already introduced him. It's a great pleasure to me to uh, continue on. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, um, thank you for coming. Uh, Gary, thanks for doing this. And um, I especially want to thank the mission today uh, for publishing uh, the story about uh, Anatole and the response we got from all over the country, um, people who knew and worked with Anatole, who learned so much from these comments. Um, uh, Julie, yeah, I'm telling you, I, I, I think the, the, in the limited amount of time that you had, I think you did an amazing job of telling not only the academic story, the music story, but a real, gave a real sense of who Anatole really was and what he accomplished. And uh, my focus is a little narrower uh, I have to admit that uh, I knew Anatole uh, really from childhood uh, because my, he and my dad were first cousins and we moved to Michigan as he did for many years. Uh, and they had a really, very close relationship all over the years. Uh, Anatole was the superstar of the family, unquestionably. Whenever anybody said or he related to a Rappaport, <laughs> he brought up the name Anatole. Uh, and there are a lot of Rappaports out there. Anatole's name, of course, rose to the top of the questionably was work at peace research and so on. Uh, game theory, as you correctly pointed out, um, is legendary. Um, and it was always a, a great uh, a great uh, way to meet someone to you know uh, to talk about Antel. But in all of his work, um, and, I, and I want to emphasize this, um, I knew him uh, not only as a, a family member, but I was also his publisher. Uh, this is a book that he wrote about leaving uh, uh, Ukraine, actually, Russia, and Crimea, all of you, all three of them, uh, leaving it as a, 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 young, a young boy, 10 years old, under very uh, difficult circumstances. Uh, he wrote this book when he was 91. And I'm happy to tell you, uh, this was not his last book, because this book came out when he was 92, uh, by a conversation with three Russians. And he had the honor, and I happened to be in the house, when he got the Russian edition of this book. Uh, many of his books were published in Russian. Uh, but they were limited to Communist Party members until last month, until Gorbachev uh, finally made them available to the public. So that was a, a big victory for him. Uh, but I think around here, uh, without a doubt, his greatest public uh, contribution was to be a pioneer in teaching. Uh, and from an academic perspective, uh, he was part of a group uh, that decided it was time uh, to have a large event. They thought they'd get maybe 500 students to show up. And fortunately, the university was pretty open to the idea in, in some ways, although there was a lot of uh, opposition uh, at the state level, the local level, uh, to this sort of thing. Uh, there was definitely support uh, within uh, the campus community. For example, they laid the curfew on women so they could come and spend, you know, spend the evening, uh, the late and early morning hours of listening to all these talks. Anatole was one of the key speakers. He was an organizer of this event, and I covered it for the Michigan Daily. 
uh, Ronnie uh, was a sophomore at the time. And uh, it was quite an event. Uh, it went on all night. Uh, all the talks were quite incredible. Uh, and there was a lot of opposition, so there was a lot of give and take back and forth. But what I remember most about this was the spirit of the give and take, so if you will, of what the university did uh, had become. So I'm, I'm very proud of Anatole for stepping forward and being a pioneer. It was a long step away from the pancakes, uh, which uh, had dominated the media in the 50s in Michigan had been going for it. So Michigan became kind of the pioneer. But there's a couple of other things that I, I want to add to this conversation. I mean, you've seen all the stories. I've shown you the books. Um, but Anatole never gave up his optimism. He always believed that at some point uh, in our history uh, that things would turn around. Of course, they haven't. Um, but uh, even though events are very parallel to what was going on this time, I think it's important to realize that he never gave up his hope. Uh, and we're seeing now worldwide opposition to the kind of totalitarian totalitarianism that he uh, opposed. So what I'd like to what I'd like to point out uh, most of all is that he never gave up his hope that the world would finally unite for peace. It's kind of happening now in a way, you know, the most unexpected way. Obviously, Putin is really on the ropes right now. Clearly, he does not have the world uh, behind him at all in any way important. And his attempt to blackmail the world is not working out at all. And I think in terms of what you've been talking about tonight is proof positive that his ideas are holding. That the world wants peace, it doesn't want war, that the leaders who are uh, trying to do these colonial wars are simply at the end of their rope. And I see that as the end point of his entire argument, going all the way back to his early work in the teachings and so on. Um, it's important to note that historically he was a soldier. He did work in the Air Force, and he did live through civil wars in Russia, both the whites and the, uh, the reds bivouac in his backyard when he was growing up and his family was free. So he had a deep understanding of the long history. But I think despite the fact that Putin has nuclear weapons and all the rest of it, the world stands united against the kind of totalitarianism that forced him to leave his home country uh, in the first place. And I think the teaching movement was a turning point in Michigan's history, certainly. It opened the door, not just here, but nationally, for the kind of conversations uh, that are going on continuously. And it's interesting to me that both the right and the left, not just here, but internationally, had pretty much united in Europe and so on, when the most conservative new government in Britain is totally behind uh, defeating Putin uh, once and for all. So I see that as kind of a culmination a lot of the ideology that he promoted, uh, both directly and indirectly, to his world. And although he wasn't as famous as a lot of the politicians uh, who oppose this type of thing, particularly Michigan, I think that his his talks and his work resonated both on campus through his academic work and especially through system theory. Uh, I happen to know a little bit about system theory and system failure, and. Uh, I would say ultimately system failure is what is going to break Putin and show the world once and for all that that approach uh, simply is not going to hold. And uh, you know, I'm thrilled beyond words to say this, despite the tragic situation that's going on in Ukraine. So Anatole, we were very fortunate that he had a long life and that he was writing well into his 90s, uh, which gives you an idea of how good he was at what he did. Uh, and the fact that he was eclectic, that he was a polymath, was a gift. It's a real example of how someone can cross boundaries and not just be a positive intellectual. If you read the comments that we got from the students and from people who work with him at the Moral Research Institute and his doctoral students and so on, you will see uh, how many lives he actually touched directly. I'm, I'm a direct uh, uh, example of, of what uh, he said. I didn't get to do everything uh, that he suggested. Uh, at one point, he suggested that I go to Illinois. Uh, as part of a delegation which my father uh, defiantly uh, opposed, that didn't quite work out. Um, but it was it was a rare example uh, of something that, that Anatole suggested that didn't actually happen. Although I wish I'd gone more interested. So um, I know there's going to be questions here, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any specific questions. I do have his book here with me, uh, and as Gary's mentioned, I do have a film tomorrow night in the Michigan Theater of the talks about mental health of all, all things. Um, and uh, it's a subject that I think he would be extremely proud to see how far uh, our state and our country have come in terms of mental health research and uh, the type of mental health work that's being done 
right here and all over the country and how, how much uh, more accepted it is and the stigma is falling away. And we're not just sending people to the hospital in Traverse City and locking them up in the which is, you know, I think, a direct result of the kind of pioneering research he did right here. And again, game theory is what he's known for, but he's worked in so many other important areas. I have to say the greatest pleasure of all is I was in a bookstore and I was publishing books, including his. And a woman, uh, one of the books I was came up to me, she said, are you related to him? So yeah. I said, I am. He's my dad's first cousin. I said, perhaps a little girl, my mother took me to a concert and play. And I was so in love with what we did. And I developed a lifelong love of music based on that one performance. And that was the kind of impact that Anatole had. I told the you know, six-year-old girl uh, falling in love with uh, classical music on the basis of his, he cut a dashing figure. Uh, and no one's mentioned his wife, Gwen, who was just a phenomenon. Um, but I do want to mention her. Um, she outlived him. Uh, she was younger than outlived him. Uh, she was a pioneer in the co-op movement and just a, a real force. And uh, together they operated a salon in Toronto, which I'm told totally a little bit more about. Uh, an artist from all over the world came, you know, to, uh, to play and be uh, part of the Toronto artist. So we're all welcoming your questions, and uh, and I hope uh, some of you uh, will take this book home. Uh, all the money is going to go to the relief effort in Ukraine, and it's all what it wanted to have. And thank you for coming. <coughs> Roger, I thank you for the for the fantastic for your words and, and and appreciation and for the for your memories, your recollections of because you remember the sixties much better than I do. And it's not for the usual reasons that one doesn't remember the sixties. <laughs> um, but uh, but I, I do want to pick up on 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 uh, one of your points and go back to the uh, what Shirley brought up from the audio of my father about sins and omissions and sins of commission. Um, and I think it's very relevant to the current situation in Ukraine, which you, uh, which you mentioned. Um, there's no doubt, and my father would entirely agree, that the sins of commission are entirely on the side of Russia in this. Mm -hmm. But I think that if you, if you consider sins of omission, I think we all have a lot more responsibility in the United States in particular than it might otherwise seem. If you think about what's been happening ever since the fall of the Soviet Union and, and, and the role of the West and the, and the U.S. in particular, in, uh, in, in, in shaping um, what, what kind of Russia emerged out of the fall of the Soviet Union. If you think about the situation in Europe, the, the failure to establish any basis of common security, but rather the, the determination to sustain a military alliance, which is always seen as a threat to those who aren't, aren't part of the alliance, regardless of the style of government that they have. If you're on the outside, then a military alliance is a threat. Um, so I think that, uh, not to make any excuses, but I think those sins of omission are key to, to the, the fix we find ourselves in at the moment. So. Well, first of all, I, I want to say um, we're so lucky to have Shirley here. Not only to have her here, but the, but the fact that she's dedicated so much time and effort to understanding the significance of what Anatole did. And I think her point is spot on. And I want to make this point because negotiation is what you do. Um, there's a negotiation going on, and I want to try to frame it this way. So we have NATO, and that's the, the military power to stop Putin and uh, anybody like him, any future Putinists from doing it. On the other hand, we have a lawyer named Putin who is uh, essentially said, you bring your businesses here to me, uh, we'll give you everything you want, we'll take over the old state businesses, we'll hand you the key, we'll make you rich, you can buy a yacht. Uh, by the way, we'll, we'll uh, say no to all the foreign debt, we'll just extinguish that. Uh, we'll bring in American bankers and lawyers uh, to sit and basically write down all of our debt. And uh, any company that wants to come in, we'll give you a fabulous deal. Um, you build our economy up, and uh, we'll treat you like gold. And uh, who paid for Putin? We did. And who, who financed? Our banks did. What oil companies came in and, and developed those oil fields for tens of billions of dollars? Our oil companies. We built his economy so that he had the money to do what he's now doing. There's no question uh, that the flip side of NATO was that they were pretending, you know, to defeat, uh, you know, provide safety at the same time we were building up all the money that he used to buy all these weapons 
and bombs and missiles. Um, and now they're leaving, of course, because they realize that, that dealing with a dictator is probably not the best way to go, particularly the Germans in light of Nord Stream uh, being blown up today. Um, and I, I cannot tell you how important it is to realize that as he closes the borders and locks in his people so that they can't flee the draft, we're now seeing a repeat of what happened a century ago. Literally, the same thing is happening again. In fact, Anatole's um, father was a draft dodger. <laughs> it's, it's incredible what's going on today. Everybody's driving to the borders to try to get away. Um, so this history is repeating itself. We learned absolutely nothing from what happened last time. And how our businesses and all the foreign businesses that, that fled, have now fled and realized uh, that his promises were empty and that he had no intention of, of being a Democrat in any way possible. Um, so I think it's an interesting point that you made. We paid for Putin's uh, war, basically. We financed it. Or not, not I should say, the, the West. The West. I just want to say that um, when this conflict broke out, um, we had conversations, um, Marcus Schreiner, Tony, and I. Um, and, and the thought was, you know, have we forgotten how to negotiate? Why can't we prevent this at the last moment? And why can't we resolve it through the negotiations quickly? But I think it takes me to your father's work about, it's not about being able to come in and negotiate to fix things last minute to prevent things or to overcome them. It's why aren't we building the institution of peace? And that's where the work that Anatole Rappaport did when he left Michigan after these turbulent times here in the 60s and was in Toronto, um, thinking about how peace in itself is a social institution and what is the research that needs to happen and the knowledge um, and the education and the institution building uh, to make peace be a reality and not be, do we look at history from one war to the next and see the repetitions every um, so many years. And so Tony, if I can um, pass the mic to you just for a moment to talk a little bit about that period because we haven't um, talked about it tonight and then maybe we have some questions that would relate. Sure, yes, my father's uh, concept of peace research, he was considered to be one of the um, leading figures of peace research during his, uh, his time of being active. Um, Peace research having three components, uh, peace uh, uh, education, and providing materials for peace activism, and what was the third one? Anyway, any rate, three components. Research. I think it was research, education, and, and, and practice. Yes. But. <laughs> research, <laughs> education, and activism, yes, yes. Uh, yes critically. Um, so the idea of creating institutions for peace, just like there are institutions for war, this is an, another uh, uh, idea that he pushed a lot during his lifetime. And finally, the recognition of the institution of war as not being military establishments confronting each other across divides, but actually one institution, parasitic on humanity, which is sapping our resources and threatening our survival. And the hope to mobilize humanity against it to uh, actually attack the institution of war with a, with a, a merciless determination to kill it forever. Um, that was his... Uh, Politics. That was his purpose in uh, working on peace research, and that was his. Um, uh, hopefully, that's his legacy. I think it's interesting because where where he thought it's legitimate to fight was the fight against the institution of war. And if you read his writings, it's just it just keeps making you stop and think um, every time. I also want to acknowledge Tony that I don't know many academics who are as familiar. Um, with the deep thinking and work of Anatole Rappaport. Um, and I think along your life, um, you've picked up several PhDs. And it, it's just incredible um, how familiar you are with so many different topics um, and how knowledgeable you are um, when your career is one of a musician. And so I, I've had so many great collegial conversations um, with, with you about his work, and it continues in this way. Gary, shall we move to any questions? Yeah, we have some questions. Oops. Uh, that little part of the way. Uh, I want to turn to the audience question. Before turning to that, I want to um, just pick up on one idea. Uh, I was really struck, Tony, by what you said uh, about music uh, as this combination of the emotional and intellectual and physical 
in this kind of non-linguistic or extra-linguistic way, this escape from the barrage uh, of words. And I wonder if you could, uh, for, for any of you, just, one thing that strikes me is there's a connection here with respect to the teaching part, the teachings that he was involved in, and the other aspects of his work, perhaps, in the following sense, that, that um, you know, there's one vision of intellectual activity, that it, which is that it's value neutral. It, it, it's value neutral, and uh, that is the, the, the goal, and that seems not to be the case with Anatole Rappaport. There is this connection between activism and engagement and commitment and intellectual, uh, scientific uh, activity, which kind of leads it into the teachings and so forth, right? Uh, but I'm struck by this, I mean, I mean, is that partly coming out of the idea that under, that there's this non-linguistic grounding, so to speak? I mean, that's a fair, that's a fair, fair understanding of the question. Well, it's a, it's a good question. You, you can't really, I can't really say it because because music is one of those areas where you don't have to engage in, in a moral way. You, you, can, you can enjoy music which expresses just about any kind of feeling and just enjoy it for its own sake. And if you stop to think about it, well, this, this music may be aggressive, this music may be even feel destructive in some way, and yet it, it's a kind of a catharsis. You don't have to worry about it. So I don't think that morality enters into that. However, in just about every other area of life, you can't really you can't really enjoy yourself without thinking about how it affects other people. It's, 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 uh, that's, that's, the, that's where disasters happen, where, 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 where crimes and of, sins, sins of omission and commission happen. So the idea of music as being the place which is outside right and wrong, but everywhere else is not being outside right and wrong. So the, the presumed neutrality of the intellectual, the idea that, that you simply, uh, I think my father liked to uh, to facetiously uh, quote the Cheshire Cat from uh, from Alice in Wonderland, because Alice asks him how to get uh, where he should go, where she should go from here, and the cat says, "Well, it depends where you want to get to, right?" Um, so he thinks he thinks that should not be the role of the scientist to just ask society. Society says its goals, and the, and the scientist, you know, figures out how to get there. Um, he rejected that view of science and insisted that science that there are certain values that are inherent in science, um, the values of truth. The values of, uh, of uh, the equality of all uh, of all observers, of all investigators, of all people to uh, access truth and to pursue truth in their own way. Um, these are sort of foundational, and he thinks that from that you can derive um, a great many values which have to inform society and which are often violated um, by by scientists among others. Um, so his first book was called Science and the Goals of Man. He published it, I think, in 1949 or something like that. Um, really early in his career, and that's where he develops these ideas, um, that, uh, that science is not value neutral, that it, it actually has values of its own, then it's the scientist's responsibility to develop those values and to, uh, and to, and to promote them, actually. So, a question that I'm going to ask, and then try to answer is, why are we here tonight? Um, and I think Anatole pretty well summed it up, you know, on the day before the teaching. He said, it's the duty of an educator to counteract misinformation oversimplification of issues and provincial self-righteousness. And I believe that protesting uh, educators are acting uh, within the province of their professional responsibility. And I think that's a very simple explanation which led uh, directly to a lot of the large turnout. A lot of people agreed with that. The fact that not everybody shared uh, uh, the view of people being critical of the world is exceptionally important, that there was debate. And I think out of that debate, um, was really the fundamental uh, gift that Anatole gave us, which is the open conversation, which is continuing today. Now the people and the state legislator, except for the governor, uh, Governor Romney, uh, who put up a big fuss about uh, how could they let this happen at the university and threaten to take money away. Uh, no, nobody remembers their names. Uh, but here we are tonight uh, talking about the ideology of Anatole who's been you know, gone since 2007. And yet his ideas, I think, uh, are even more important today uh, than when he was writing them. You know, they're even more timely. Um, there's absolutely no question um, that he was right on so many uh, different levels. And I want to add this point. When I said that we paid for this war, that we gave Putin the money that the West gave him, he didn't get that money from the Russian people. He, the, the businesses that provided all the profit so that he became 
incredibly wealthy to the tune of billions and rich people. That money came from Western businesses, no question about it. And what did he do with that money? He didn't just set up an army, he set up his own army. The, the army we're talking about that, that are arresting people right and left and are getting the draft and going door to door on these elections, that's his private army. He has his own army of 400,000 people. So that if the Joint Chiefs of Staff, whatever they're called in Russia, don't agree with him, he's got his own 400,000 person, personal army that reports directly to him. The money for that came from the West. Uh, and that was Anatole's whole point, you know, that we have to realize that we have, you, can't, you can't have any uh, possibility of working with somebody who is a total dictator, uh, who made it very clear from the first day he came into office what he was going to do. Can I answer also? Um, it's, it's interesting to hear your question because um, one answer is in um, the article that I um, um, put together, um, and it goes back to Anatole Rapport in 1932, before he was academic, when he was studying music. He was actually also writing, um, and he wrote um, that somebody said it takes three to make music, one to compose, one to interpret, and one to conceive. Um, and this is his words. I would say that the embodiment of the three might become the ideal artist musician, to record the movements of his soul by um, symbols, put living force into the symbols, and translate that um, resulting sound back into emotions, not merely the ability to do it, the longing to do it. Um, and I think, um, you know, if you take what, what he saw as his role as a musician to create for others and the sophistication of seeing and perspective taking into this, um, he was not just a theorist, he was a practitioner, and, and he brought his ethics and values into that. Um, I don't think there's anything neutral um, in, in that equation, and I invite everyone to think um, about what you do in that way. I mean, his goal was to foster peace, um, and everything he did in his, in his uh, scholarly life um, through the years was dedicated to that. So please, if you're in the room, uh, raise your hand, and uh, we'll know what that means, right? You're online, uh, please submit your question through the chat, as some of you have, and why don't we start with this one that came from online. Uh, human history is a history mostly of wars, little of peace. Did the advent of the atom bomb catalyze Rappaport's idea of the inevitability of peace? I think we're directing that to you, sure. Tony. <laughs> It's true that the history is told largely in terms of wars. It's also told largely in terms of kings. Um, the, 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 the focus of traditional history is so rarely the focus on actual life or what's important to, to most people. Um, now, there's attempts to, to write a different history. Uh, I think he was in the mire of, uh, of Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States as, a, as an alternative way of telling history. He also uh, was very... Uh, uh, aware of the of the predominance of men's stories in the way history is told, and how women's stories might very well be an entirely different. This is uh, ideas that he came to uh, fairly late in life, but that, that he embraced. Um, so, so that's one side of it. Now, the question of whether the whether the nuclear weapons made peace inevitable, uh, my father would certainly not agree in any way. Um, he would point out that that there's never been a weapon that hasn't been used. Now, so far. The uh, hydrogen bomb has not been used yet, but it, it's you know that doesn't that's not a sign of what's to come. Um, the uh, the prediction that because it hasn't been used so far, it will never be used is um, is just about unsupportable. Uh, you can't really claim that that that's that, that our experience so far is going to extend indefinitely into the future. Every other weapon that's been used, including the atomic weapon itself, has been used. Every weapon that's been invented, so not likely. Also, the, the very idea that peace is inevitable, he would never have said that. He wrote a book called Peace, an Idea Whose Time Has Come, but he was certainly intending that to be hopeful, or an attempt at uh, in investing in what small hope there is, rather than a prediction of, of the inevitable. So, um, you know, Tony, uh, in your remarks, you, uh, you, know, you, you identified some of these pathologies of the 1950s, so to speak, I mean, uh, uh, the threat of nuclear war, McCarthyism, uh, social conformity. Uh, I was also, as you were talking about that, also thinking about the uh, the increase in the growth of ex uh, uh, the, the distracting element of uh, accelerating 
uh, personal prosperity, of uh, television, of, of things of this sort, right? And I wonder uh, if any of you have comments on, uh, I'm sorry, this also relates to the, to the quote, uh, to, the, to the passage that you played uh, uh, about, uh, you know, in a way, is the environmental movement almost a distraction from a different sort of, uh, a different sort of threat? And I wonder if any of you have reflections on this with respect to, today, to today's environment. And, uh, the element of distraction in society as a, as a, uh, as its own pathology, so to speak. Um, well, first of all, I, I don't think anybody in this room would disagree um, with, it, with that, that idea. Um, I think it's, it's, it's something that everybody, but I also think at the same time that Anatole was a highly focused individual. That's kind of ironic, given the breadth of his career. Uh, but peace was something that he thought about continuously. And I remember the last time I was there, there was a, a couple that had come from Japan who had followed his work and they were doing peace research. And they'd come away. And that was, the, that was his life. And that was what he was really known for. Yes, game theory was important, but as, a, as part of his peace research, uh, showing that working together is. Uh, everybody wins, basically, was his idea. And I think he saw a lot of this chatter, which is what, I, what it's called, I think there's a psychologist here who talks a lot about this. this chatter is completely irrelevant to what the central issue is, which is exactly what Tony just nailed it. And I, I want to amplify that comment. That there's never been a weapon that has never been used except either and bomb. And that really doesn't count. I'm sorry, you know. It's just an advanced form of the nuclear weapons that we use in Japan. But what I want to say about this is that I was just in a conference and uh, I had a booth and one of the people down the hall uh, had another booth and he was uh, talking about uh, suicide prevention and he had lost his daughter to suicide. And uh, the story is that he had a gun perfectly locked in a perfect safe and he also had cables around it and the daughter somehow figured out not only how to defeat the cables, but how to find the lock combination where she thought she didn't know, somehow she figured it out by watching him when he didn't realize she was there. She opened the case, got the gun out, and shot herself. And that is the sum total of what Anatole was talking about. If you have a weapon, there's a reasonable chance that somebody's going to use it. And that was what Anatole talked about. And fundamentally, you have to find a way to disarm. And that was his whole, the whole point of his entire career was we can't just have all these weapons lying around and hope that nobody's going to use them. Putin is merely brandishing the threat of them and using it as a way to completely turn Russia upside down, you know. Um, and, of course, it's not working uh, in that respect, so I guess that's something to think about. I just wanted to add one thing. Um, if you remember his, uh, his ideas about the barrage of words that were surrounded by um, but you realize that that was uh, spoken in um, 1970, um, and how the internet has uh, has increased our exposure to words and images and, and all kinds of uh, influences uh, beyond our physical surroundings. Um, the effect, of course, exacerbated by the pandemic when, when we became that much more reliant on, on the internet and electronics. So, and, and clearly, I mean, the people, psychologists have pointed to, to very dramatic effects uh, that we've seen over the last few years, a couple of years in particular. So, yes. So another question from online. Uh, this is actually from uh, Maurice Chalman, who uh, was, whose father was uh, was a co-author uh, with Anatole. Uh, the question is, I would like to know if I'd walked into Rappaport's lab during one of his 1960s iterated prisoner's dilemma experiments on an average day, what would I have seen? Were these undergraduate students or Ann Arbor residents? What were they asked to do? What did it look like? Um, that's a great question. Roger, were you ever in the lab? No. <laughs> Unfortunately not. I can talk about what it's like today, but do you know what, what it was like back then? Well, just a little bit. I think that he did he didn't do a lot of experimentation, but he did some, especially while he was here uh, with Christmas Dilemma experiments. And they were pretty low key in the sense that you just come in and you and you have situations that are presented to you and you make one of two choices. So it's not like they were doing anything um, anything uh, very uh, traumatic to uh, to the research subject. Um, however, he was very concerned about the ethics of experimentation, and these, these guidelines were being developed 
over the course of his career to make sure that, for instance, deception wasn't used um, in, in psychological experiments or, or experiments on humans in general. Um, so I don't think that his were, his were very uh, dangerous that way. So probably the people would arrive and be uh, the situation would be described to them, and they'd be asked to uh, check one or two boxes, and, and uh, so it's, it's probably fairly low key. And I can just add, just in general, the way a lot of this research is done is, is randomly assigning people to different conditions and just seeing how those decisions differ in one way or another. Um, to me, it, it would be fascinating because I can see the people here. Um, we can't see the people who are watching virtually, but, but I'm assuming that there were people who were here at the time that Roger was here as a student. Um, and if we were to write another retrospective um, Michigan Today article, you know, is there anyone who was there, who participated, mm -hmm. who came? You know, did they spend the time to talk to people before or after? Did you have a conversation? Um, were you at the teach-ins? And so I think there's still um, time to capture some of those conversations. And, and this is an invite to anyone who hears this today or later to to talk to us because it's it's just really fun to to forge those real relationships um, and connect. So, so we, we, we addressed to some extent how he, how and why he ended up at the University of Michigan, but, but why didn't he? Yeah. It might, I, if, I can, if I can answer that a little bit of length, um, it might be interesting to say something about why, what's not why he left. <laughs> because um, as there was a, a, a campaign of, uh, of, of, of harassment directed at intellectuals during the 1960s. It was called a COINTELPRO. Um, and this is something that's been vastly documented in research, and my father was identified as one of the many targets of this. Um, so, uh, I, want, I, I want to read this actually, you know, it's not why, why we left, but uh, okay. So this comes from Locke Johnson, who was, was special assistant to the chair of the church committee which was the United States Senate Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with Respect to Intelligence Activities in 1975. And in an article about the experience of the findings of the Church Committee, he says, among the thousands of COINTELPRO co victims was Dr. Anatole Rappaport, a gifted social scientist at the University of Michigan. He had attracted the FBI's attention because of his criticism of the war in Indochina and his suspicious origins. He had been born in Russia shortly before his parents immigrated to America early in the 20th century. The FBI's agent in charge for the Ann Arbor area, responding to top secret directives from Bureau headquarters, set out to neutralize Professor Rappaport, a term used by the FBI to mean the harassment of an individual as a means for curbing his or her dissent. The Bureau mailed anonymous letters to senior administrators at the university, as well as to prominent citizens in Ann Arbor and throughout the state, claiming the Rappaport was, if not a communist, and at least an apologist for communism and a troublemaker. The letters were typically signed a concerned citizen or a concerned taxpayer. The FBI also placed informants in Ralph Report's classrooms to report on his subversive activities. He was to be embarrassed, discredited, and spied upon in whatever imaginative ways the FBI special agent could devise. Now, uh, Johnson actually came to see my father in Toronto years later and explained all this to him. Uh, and, uh, and my father was, uh, had, had been aware that there was, uh, that there was some dirty tricks going on. He and my mother always felt that they were under surveillance, but he didn't know the extent of it. Um, and so he was uh, kind of bemused that somebody would come with all, all this knowledge of all this and tell it to him in a rather matter-of-fact way. Um, but Johnson uh, actually, in, his, in this article and in another book, exaggerated the effect. He, he felt that this had driven uh, my father out of the country and perhaps even ruined his career. And it was actually quite Quite the contrary. My father was very eager to leave the United States for, because of the political situation at the time in the late 60s. Um, he was very eager to go to a, a different country. His first choice was Denmark and the uh, second choice was Canada where we ended up. Um, he, uh, his, his career was exactly what he wanted after that. He loved, uh, he loved Toronto and, and immediately upon arriving really was clear he wanted to spend the rest of his life there. Um, and uh, and, and his, had a very fulfilling career with some, you know, being a guest professor in Europe and all sorts of dreams come true and that kind of thing. So his, his life is good. And Johnson sort of, perhaps for effect, to sort of uh, emphasize the destructive uh, effects of Cohen Shaw because Johnson was highly critical of it. He, he just sort of exaggerated the impact on our family. Um, but um, so, yeah, the real reasons were, first of all, that he, there was great concern about the direction the United States was going. 
um, the, with the election of uh, Richard Nixon in 1968, the further escalation of the Vietnam War, which continued right up to 1975, the, uh, the assassinations, the um, you know, continued uh, harassment of, uh, of, of dissidents, um, dissenters. Um, what my father experienced was minor compared to the uh, overt violence directed at black leaders, um, um, murder uh, by, by, uh, by uh, government agents. Um, so there's, he was very aware of, uh, of those problems and, and left for that reason. Also, he was, he was really um, uncomfortable with what he felt would be the responsibility of an American to engage in political activity um, because he thought it was the right thing to do, but he really personally uh, uh, didn't like it. He associated it with trying to sell something. He never wanted to, to, for his intellectual work, to be anything to do with trying to sell something. He just wanted to share rather than sell. And, and that's what he associated with, with direct political engagement, like trying to elect candidates or that kind of thing. So uh, those are the reasons why we went to Canada. And if I can just add really quickly, because this is reminding me of the autobiography um, of his that I read, and now it's three years. But I remember that feeling of being active was an obligation, was something you had to do, and he did it here. But I think in a way, he wanted a more peaceful life. And in another place, he was able to have that. And so it, it's kind of complementing what we're hearing from Tony right now. Um, he made a choice. Um, of where to continue to, to live and, and work and, and be with family. Yeah, um, I um, just heard that Chandler Davis died on mm -hmm. Saturday. Right. And um, I know there were colleagues here at the University of Michigan and colleagues also at the University of Toronto. And I wondered if their relationship had anything to do with him moving from here to there. Absolutely. Chandler uh, pulled strings to uh, get the invitation to come to Toronto. As soon as he heard that my father was uh, was looking for another position, he, he, he did what he could to, he was in the mathematics department at, at the at U of T and he um, basically was responsible for, for that invitation being extended. Yes, and he was a, he was a great friend as well as a colleague, uh, Rick. Uh, I, I was a friend of his too, so it's a great loss. Um, for those of you who don't know, Chandler uh, was one of three uh, professors who were fired. One was later reinstated after he agreed to name names. Chandler went to jail for six months in Denver, Connecticut. I interviewed him at the length. Um, and um, he was very proud of the fact uh, that he convinced Anatole uh, to move to Toronto. He felt it was a great move. Um, he did, of course, he did the same thing himself. And um, uh, former President Chichel, uh, at a, the winter commencement in 2015, I happen to have the speech here, um, gave a speech. There's now actually a lectureship named for those three professors. Um, you may know that, um, and you know, roundly condemned uh, this 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 terrible breach of uh, academic freedom. Um, and it's actually quite a quite a speech. Um, but the, what's interesting is that uh, the administration went above and beyond the recommendation of the faculty committee uh, that did not recommend that they all uh, be terminated. Uh, you know, and Harlan Asher, who was the president at the time, um, you know, basically caved to all the political pressure. Um, and it's interesting that Anatole, uh, despite what Tony has said, was never uh, really uh, personally interrogated by the Un-American Activities Committee while people around him were being, you know, sent to jail or, you know, and so forth. Although the Chairman Davis incident happened before he, he got here. Um, but uh, what's interesting, uh, I think many of you noticed, Arthur Miller also was held in contempt. Although that was later reversed on appeal, so he was all you know, part of that group. Uh, but we're, we were all sort of amazed that he never even got called uh, to testify. My mother, uh, we were living in Detroit, she got called uh, to, uh, to appear before the Michigan American Activities Committee. Um, so we thought it was interesting that Anatole was never, never called. Uh, it could have been his military background, we're not, we're not really sure. He, he did serve in the Air Force, so who knows. I'm not sure. Um, oh, and briefly, I just want to mention the COINTEL program. Um, the, uh, there was a program here in Ann Arbor that was wider uh, than Anatole, and um, it involved the CIA documents. Uh, and one of the people who was an organizer who I wrote about uh, ended up telling him, trying to recruit and so forth from the FBI office where he had a job. And one of the students that he tried to recruit turned him into the president of the 
Um, that was kind of the end, the end of his his career for you know he blew his cover basically. So. Okay, well I think we, we, we've got to sort of wrap up. Maybe we can do that with one last uh, reflection, uh, just from each of you. Uh, how? Uh, the impossible question, I suppose. How would you summarize Anatole Rappaport's legacy? Um, I can start. Peace. Peace. Okay. So I'm avoiding the barrage of words. It's a, words. It's an act of omission by intentionally answering with one word um, because it's, you know, what can each and every one of us do in every moment of, uh, of our being to make peace be a reality in our lives and around, the lives of people ar around us and um, people around the globe. So I really think um, peace. I think, I think his legacy is really one of engagement, um, really about, uh, he always said that everybody um, can, can do something and everybody should do what they feel like they can do most effectively. So in his case, he, he was an academic, but he, he equally valued the, the work of, of all kinds of people doing all kinds of activism or, or all, things, all kinds of things in daily life. So just being engaged and caring and, um, and, and trying to make a difference, uh, I think that's probably a... Uh, well, um, although he never saw combat personally, I think Anatole was a fighter his whole life, and he fought for this idea um, that the most important thing, you know, across all, all countries is what you just said. But I think more to the point, um, a lot of his thinking has proved out to be prophetic. I think that's part of why we have an audience tonight, uh, and I think the world is coming around. You know, I, I, I think. Even a couple of years ago, the idea that all nations would come together, uh, you know, to to end tyranny uh, collectively at great, you know, personal, you know, great sacrifice. Um, obviously, uh, it's a wartime situation in more ways than one. And I think Anatole is, was not only prophetic, and not only right, but I think uh, his ideas people have picked up on what he was talking about. And I think. Um, the game theory is, is certainly part of that. Uh, I think planted the seed of the idea. I just wish that he had lived longer and been able to see uh, the fruits of his labor. Okay, well, thank you all for a wonderful, for a wonderful discussion. And uh, thank you to the audience. Uh, we welcome your feedback uh, anytime uh, from the audience. You can just go to the Charter Observatory website and uh, there's a contact form on there. Uh, I want to look at the two upcoming events. Uh, next Thursday, October 6th, we will have a discussion of the recent discovery that the long prized Galileo manuscript held by U of M is in fact a forgery, as you might have seen in the New York Times uh, and elsewhere. We'll cover the scientific significance of Galileo's discoveries, the story of the manuscript, and the story of its exposure. Uh, our guests will be Nick Wilding, professor from Georgia State. Uh, University, who started this whole process, and Pablo Alvarez from the uh, UW Special Collection. And our other guest will be the manuscript itself. So if you want to see uh, a, a classical 1920s forgery of a 15th century manuscript, then please come up on next Thursday. Uh, then on October 13th, the next in this Making Michigan series uh, is with Deirdre Villa Cruz from UW's History Department. Will talk with us about the university's extensive collections of documents, artifacts, and specimens from the, from the Philippines across a lot of our uh, museums and libraries that were, of course, uh, collected in problemat problematic, uh, colonizing ways, and about a new project uh, called Reconnect, Reconnect, Recollect to seek to address the history of those uh, collections and how they ended up uh, at, uh, at U of M. This session is going to be posted on YouTube uh, with a cleaned up transcript in about a week. And if you've registered for the event, then you should get a notification of that. Uh, for those of you who are here, the observatory is going to be up, well, upstairs. It's going to be open for a little while with those ready to explain things. And 
Is there a, is the sky clear enough for? Yeah, we'll be up there with a small telescope on the patio at the top of the stairs. Okay. So if you want to do a little bit of observing uh, for just a little while, we'll be open up there. Uh, and those of you online, I hope you can join us in, in person sometime. And until then, be safe and uh, stay well and keep open. Good night and thank you all.